Today I was talking about these stages of meditation just to give you some idea of what to expect. And of course the next thing to understand is how do you achieve or reach or experience those wonderful stages of meditation? Because having set out the wonderful bliss and happiness and ecstasy, of course people would love to experience that and I hope that you can experience some of those states as well. But how is it achieved? And for many of you, just like myself, the first time I had a very deep meditation, it was just so wonderful, and I wanted it back again so much, it took about three or four years until I could re-experience those deep states. And that's common for many people who have their first deep experience of meditation and get so frustrated they can't get it back again. <coughs> and the, <coughs> sorry, the trick was, what I understood was instead of aiming for the results, what you should aim for is set up the causes. So look for the causes and then the results come by themselves. If you look for the results, then you forget the causes. Just like I said, I think in um, the Happiness Through Meditation, the Mindfulness Bliss and Beyond book. It's just like a person looks at all the dishes in their kitchen which are dirty and thinks, oh, when will my dishes become clean? I want my dishes to become clean. I wish my dishes would become clean. People who think like that, the dishes never become clean. That's like a person, oh, I want jhanas, I want deep meditation again. When am I going to get deep meditation again? You'll never get deep meditation that way. But the wise person says, yeah, my dishes were clean once because I washed them up. So <laughs> they start washing up the dishes, they create the causes for clean dishes. And in a short time, all the dishes are clean again. So instead of just saying, I want deep meditation, what causes the deep meditation? Why did it happen? And you find out it's all about letting go, leaving things alone, stopping controlling, relaxing, resting, making peace, and not striving. That becomes the cause. And so that our whole job in this meditation retreat is just to create the causes and to create so many good causes that it's only a matter of time until this meditation really takes off. But even if you're a great meditator, you can't expect every meditation to be a winner. It's just like that story I developed of the man who went to work on Monday. And after working so hard all day, he went home and his wife said, did you get paid today? He said, no, I got nothing, but I really worked hard. And he went to work on Tuesday, and again he worked really hard and still got nothing. And he went to work on Wednesday, and still, after a hard day's work, didn't get paid. So he told his wife, I'm not going to carry on going to work like this. You work hard all day, you get nothing. And his wife said, oh, come on, go to work for one more day. So he went to work on Thursday, the same thing happened. Worked all day and didn't get paid. He only went to work on Friday because he had nothing else to do. And when he went to work on Friday, the boss gave him a big pay packet. And so when he went home, he told his wife, darling, I figured it all out. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Fridays. <laughs> now that's a stupid thing to think, isn't it? Well, that's why we think, I'm only going to do meditation when it works, when it gets payday. Remember, when you get payday in your meditation, that is because of all that other hard work you've done. You know, sitting down, meditating, just making peace, being kind, being gentle. It may not work this time, it may not work the next time, it may not work the day after. But remember, Friday is only three days' time. Payday. <laughs> or sometimes you may get paid earlier. So, don't get frustrated or disappointed. As long as you're building up the causes, it's only a matter of time when you get the results. So what are the causes for this deep meditation? It is absolutely so simple. I've said it many times before, just like that lake, there's only waves on the surface if there's a wind. Stop the wind, 
and you'll find that the lake will move less and less and less. The waves get less, the ripples get less, until it becomes perfectly smooth. So your job as a meditator, your right effort is to stop, is to guard, is to make sure you're not interfering with this process. Your job is to get out of the way. And that does take a lot of skill and effort, just to say no, stop doing things. And instead what we do, we call this a doing, but it's not really doing very much. It's just being kind and being aware. Those two factors together. As I mentioned earlier, with your body, if you're mindful of the body and give it compassion, everything relaxes and gets easy. Channels of energy open up, pains disappear, simply because the kindness just leaves things alone and the mindfulness can give you that feedback to see whether the compassion is working. And actually just everything gets easier, more relaxed and more peaceful. And those two qualities, mindfulness and compassion, are the key. And to emphasize that and to reinforce these stages of meditation, I developed a simile of the thousand-petaled lotus. And you all know that a lotus is a symbol of Buddhism. You've got one over there in that little wooden thing, whatever it's called. And you see lotuses in many, many different um, monasteries. If not a lotus pond, then pictures of lotuses and um, carvings of lotuses. And so lotuses are all over the place, sort of in Buddhist uh, temples and monasteries. And they used to even have a lotus racing car. It kept on losing because everyone was driving very mindfully and they weren't trying to win. Like I'm telling you here, try and be a loser, not a winner. Be kind, don't try and sort of force the issue. But lotus is a symbol, a symbol of Buddhism. And the thousand petal lotus simile goes like this. There is a lotus which is closed up at night time, as you've seen before. It closes at night. And the outer petals of the lotus are always very rough, coarse, dirty, and there's no fragrance to them at all. It's not the most beautiful flower when the lotus is closed up because that outermost petal has to withstand the weather and the dust and the rain and everything else to protect the more delicate petals inside. But early in the morning when the sun rises, when the first light and warmth of the sun hit that outermost petal of the lotus, it receives the light and warmth and it starts to open out. And as it opens because of the warmth and the light of the sun, it reveals the next layer of petals inside, which are still quite thick and coarse, but at least they start to look like a flower petal. And also they have a slight fragrance to them. And because that is now revealed, it allows the warmth and the light of the sun to hit that next layer of petals. So that too can open out to reveal the next layer of petals. And that receives the warmth and light of sun, so that too can open out. So the one inside can receive the light and warmth of the sun, so it can open out. And the deeper you go into the lotus, the more fragrant are the petals, the more beautiful and the more delicate they are. The deeper you go in, the more beautiful are all these petals. And that is a simile of meditation. You are that lotus. When you're all closed up, you are coarse, rough, no fragrance, a very unlikely candidate for enlightenment. <laughs> but don't worry in all of you little dirty lotuses sitting in front of me. Inside are the most fragrant and beautiful and delightful petals. All oh, right inside this body and mind sitting in front of me right now. And that, for one thing, that is an amazing understanding. Everybody, right inside of themselves, has these jhanas, has enlightenment, has the whole works. You just need to go deep inside of yourself. 
It's not that you're missing something. It's, just, it's not like you've been born without the jhana gene, so you know where you can get it. No, no, no. Every one of you, if you can just open out, you'll find the deepest peace, happiness, bliss, and profound wisdom you could ever expect, right inside, right now, where you are. So your job is to open up the lotus. And I said the real lotus is opened up by the light and the warmth of the sun. The light represents mindfulness, being aware, and the warmth represents compassion, kindness. That is what opens up the lotus. So the outermost lotus, this old body sitting here, this body which you have, you close your eyes and you're aware and kind of the body, to the body. Any ache and pain, you're aware of it, you give it kindness and you find it relaxes. Any tightness and tension with mindfulness and compassion, it too relaxes. And with mindfulness and compassion on your body, soon the body gets so relaxed and comfortable, nothing is really bothering you, so then you can leave the body and go inside into the mental world. If you have an ache or a pain, a cough or an itch, it's so hard to attend to the mental world. The body will take precedence. So you have to somehow calm the body with mindfulness and compassion combined and then you will find the body will be relaxed and start to disappear enough so you can focus on the mental world. You can actually sit still and attend to the mind. And that is actually quite an amazing thing to do. You know sometimes people try and sit still through force. Yeah, they can sit still but they never get enlightened. You know some of the people who sit, or not sit, but actually stand still for hours are the guards at Buckingham Palace. They stand up there and people take photographs of them. People try to get them to move by putting their arms around them or trying to say rude things to them. But those guards in Buckingham Palace in London, they stand perfectly still, that's their training. But that's through force because they're soldiers. The real way to fit, sit still is not through force, but just through this mindfulness and compassion. So the body gets so relaxed, it's still all by itself. You don't have to hold it, you don't have to force it, it's just there, nice and still. That is so relaxing. And of course, because it's still and not causing you any problems, it disappears. That outermost petal of the lotus, which causes you a lot of trouble, the body, with old age and sickness and illness and itches and fevers and allergies and everything else, that's opened up so you can go inside to your mental world. And that mental world has got so much stuff going on. And of course, the thing which you first have to open up is this aspect of the mental world called time. We are such a prisoner of time. And it's amazing how time tortures us. All the stuff which happened to you in the past, that is just like this torturer who keeps on coming up, even though it's gone away a long time ago, keeps on reminding us of the pain we had to endure in the past, but never lets us be free. And then we also have the anxieties of what we think is going to happen in the future. And those anxieties also never let us be still. It stops you sleeping at night when you're worried about what are the results of the biopsies? Well, what is going to happen to the stock market? Is it going to be the end of the world on December the 21st, 2012? That's only a month to go. Actually, what day is it today? Is it the 21st? 20th. 20th today. I thought it was just one month. One month and one day to go. It'd be really wonderful if it was the end of the world. You have nothing to worry about. All those plans you have, I've got to raise funds for the nuns' monastery, I've got to figure out how I'm going to go to all these other places next week. There's always problems in the Buddhist society. If it's the world's going to end in 21st, it doesn't matter, you don't have to fix anything. You can relax and enjoy yourself. You don't have to worry about all those bills you have to pay. Just put them aside. You don't have to pay them anyway. You, know, you won't go to jail before the 21st of December. 
So you're free. The trouble is, though, the world doesn't end. You know, I, I, there was this very, very wise, smart man in the United States last year because I think last year they also, some guy said the world was going to end in October uh, 2011. Remember that? He was a crazy pastor in the United States. Many people believed him. He said he was absolutely sure the world was going to end in what's that, October the 13th or something, 2011. So many people believed him, they started setting up things and there was one very smart atheist who said, well look, according to your religion, when you get raptured up to heaven, you can go but your pets can't go. You can't have dogs and cats fighting each other in heaven. So according to their philosophy, the dogs and cats have to stay here on earth. And this man was arguing that who's going to look after your little dog which you love so much? There'll be no one there to feed them or give them water. And your little cat which you love so much, they can't go to heaven, they've got a few years to live. Who's going to give them milk and cat food? And he said, look, for $1,000 US per pet, I will guarantee to look after them. And look, I'm an atheist. God doesn't exist. Jesus sucks. Whatever he said, he was obviously an atheist. So they said, well, certainly he's not going to go to heaven. So he said, I can look after you. I'm going to be there. I can look after your pets. <laughs> and with a few of his friends, got a lot of people you know, emailing him, yeah, can you please look after my pet for me? Because people love their pets. You don't want your pet to do without you. And they really believe 100% that they were going to disappear on October the 13th or whatever it was. So this guy was receiving all these checks and transfers of $1,000, of course non-refundable. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a killing from these stupid people because it never happened. You know, they've still got their pets, they were still there to look after them, but he got $1,000 per pet and that was a lot of money, he made a fortune. When I heard that, you always thought, oh, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> It's not going to end, so you don't have to worry about that. But, time. Why, actually, why do always people like worrying about the end of the world? Why do they like worrying about who's going to win the election? You know, one of my pe friends who was supposed to be looking after me in Toronto, he was staying up all night to see who would win, Obama or Romney. <laughs> and so he couldn't look after me the next day, he was half asleep, falling asleep in meditation. Why do you do that for? Because they were worrying so much about what would happen. You worry about the Olympic Games and stay up all night. You can read it in the paper tomorrow, who cares? No, but I've got to find out now. <laughs> Why is it that we worry so much? We are prisoners of time. Always wanting to find out what will happen. That is why we go to fortune tellers. We want to find out because we're afraid of what might happen if. As far as I'm concerned, yeah, whatever happens, you'll be able to handle it. So who wants to know the fortune? When you have no fear, when you trust in yourself and your abilities to cope, there's no need to go to fortune tellers. And you can learn this by going into the centre of time. So this layer of petals just inside the body, time, you have to see how you can open that out to get literally into the centre of time, which is this present moment just now. And how do you do that? Just be aware, just be kind. With that kindness and awareness, the present moment becomes such a wonderful place you're not interested in the past or the future. You're trusting in this moment. Now is the place your future is being made. The present moment is the only time you have to make a future. So little by little, with mindfulness and kindness, time opens up and you're right in the centre. The present moment, which is in the centre of time. And you know that's like a great liberation. All that stuff in the past, which I should be worried about. All those terrible, stupid jokes I've told over the years. 
I can let it all go. And all those fears you have of what might happen in the future, because I had bacon this morning, that's bad for you. I'm going to die, I'm going to have cholesterol, I'm going to have, oh, I don't worry. When you, you, know, you don't, when you don't worry, you don't die. One of the uh, favourite quotes of this comedian, George Burns, 96, on his birthday, he was interviewed in the newspapers, and I remember reading this. The interviewer said, you're 96 years of age, you still go to nightclubs almost every night, staying up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's okay if you're a teenager, when you're 96, <laughs> and you drink whiskey by the bottle. And you didn't smoke c cigarettes, you smoked cigars, you know, big ones. And you oh. eat all fatty food, hamburgers, anything fried, you have it. Aren't you afraid for your health? You know, with that type of lifestyle. And he replied, and it's a brilliant reply, I'm not afraid of my lifestyle. I'm not worried about it. My wife was worried about my lifestyle, and that's why she died 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now that is really important. It's the worry which kills you more than anything else. The worry over into the future. It stops you being peaceful and enjoying the present or the lingering, torturing yourself about what happened in the past. One of the great things in Buddhism, which when I heard this, it really impressed me, and one of the reasons I became a Buddhist, there is no such thing as guilt and punishment in Buddhism. You're not, you're not supposed to punish yourself. Yeah, you made a mistake, you told a stupid joke, you let it go. You don't go punishing yourself or remembering afterwards, oh, I shouldn't have done that, oh, I shouldn't have said that, oh, I really made a mess that time. That is absolutely ridiculous, you do things like that. You just let it go, acknowledge it, you forgive it, and you learn from it not to do it again. Simple as that. But you don't go carrying it around with you. When you don't torture yourself from the past, when you don't worry yourself sick about the future, it's like coming out of a prison. You're free. I don't have to keep punishing myself over what I did. That's why this law of karma is amazing. You only punish yourself because you're stupid. You can actually let go of the past and it's so easy to do that. I remember talking to psychologists about this. You can let go of every trauma, everything which has happened to you. You can do it. The only reason you don't is because you think you can't. Or you think you're not allowed to. All you need is some guy like me, who you've got confidence with, who says, yeah, you can do it. Do it. You're allowed. I'll give you permission. And then they do it and they find, wow, it's gone. They're free. It is that simple. It undermines the psychologists. They're losing business when people do this. If you go to psychologists, you have to keep going over it again and again, session after session after session after session. That keeps them in, in business. You go to me and say, just let it go, once and for all, okay, and that's it, done, finished. <laughs> Free. <laughs> if you can do that. This is actually how you learn how to do it. You go into the present moment with kindness and mindfulness. Time vanishes, you're just here and all those burdens you've been carrying around, those big heavy shopping bags, they're gone. You're just here, you've gone into the present moment. That layer of petals, you're going in, that is already pretty beautiful and fragrant. But you've got more to come yet, you've only just started getting into this amazing lotus. And how do you do that? Mindfulness and kindness just opens it up. You try to peel, you know, the lotus petals and you just break them all. No, just be mindful, be kind, and just after a while it happens. As many of you experience, you come into the present moment. You're mindful, you're aware, you're kind, and life is nice. That's why we have this retreat center. There's nothing much to do. There's no newspapers or TV, so you don't know what's going on in the world. You don't know what happened. So it's beautiful, you're totally free of time. You come into this timeless realm. So lovely just to be here enjoying every moment, just like when you were a kid. 
Children usually live in the present moment. They can have this big fight, screaming at each other, crying their eyes out, the next minute they're playing together as if they've been friends for life. Why can't humans do that? You know, why can't the Palestinians and Israelis be like kids? Yeah, you bomb me. Ah, oh, yeah, but we love you. <laughs> Instead of carrying around the past like this. So in the present moment, you come right into the center of now. And that's beautiful layer of petals called the present moment. And then what do you do next? Just carry on being mindful and being kind. And when that present moment opens up, with mindfulness and kindness, that's all, you get this incredible profound layer of petals called silence. Silence is right inside of the present moment. You're just being mindful, kind to this present moment. You just notice there's no thoughts going on. You're quiet. You're perfectly aware without giving things a name, without writing notes or figuring out what things mean. You just know. Right in the middle of the present moment is incredible gorgeous silence. And you've had experiences of silence from time to time in this retreat. And it's so delightful, so pleasant and profound. Sometimes when you experience silence so much, you just experience just, or you realize just, just how desecrating are words. You now we try and capture the meaning of things with words and we just spoil the experience. If you're listening in a great concert, especially classical music, you may have been in a concert hall, listen to this great performance. If you turn around to your friend and say, wow, this is really good music, you'll be thrown out of the theatre. You're making a noise, you're interrupting the flow of this beautiful uh, symphony. In the same way that whenever you say something in your head, you're interrupting the beautiful flow of life. Experience it in silence. Eat in silence and you'll taste the food much more. You miss so much when we're talking or when we're thinking. And how do you get to the silence? Just carry on being mindful. Be kind. When everything calms down, just like your body relaxes through mindfulness and kindness, your mental world relaxes and there's nothing to say anymore. There's no words to think. You just hear, quiet, aware. In that silence, you don't interrupt anything or do anything. Just maintain this kindness and this awareness. And these petals called silence, they open up. And inside the next layer of petals, as I mentioned yesterday, is your breath. You don't even go looking for it. You just stay kindness, mindful, and inside the silence is your breathing. I mentioned yesterday, because it's the only thing which is moving. If you follow this meditation that way, you don't look for the breath, you don't go out and catch it and, and put it in a cage and say, now I'm going to be with you breath for the next 10 or 15 minutes. That's not the way to meditate. That's how many people do Anapanasati. Now I'm going to watch the breath. Okay, in, out, in, out, come on, watch the breath, stupid. That is not really the way of Buddhist meditation. Just be kind, be mindful, and the breath comes to you. And as you sit there just watching the breath, that breath is always very, very delightful. Even more beautiful than the silence. Just breathing in and breathing out. You might say that there's another layer of petals opens up, that's the full awareness of the breath. When you just see every moment of breath, from the very beginning to the end, effortlessly. Because this is such a simple thing you're watching, there's a certain happiness, pleasure of simplicity. Our lives are so complicated, it tires us out. Just one thing to do, just watching one breath go in. It's so simple, so easy. You feel just so free. At last you have a sim... People like a simple lifestyle, but this is like simplicity in the moment. 
Hardly anything could be more simple than all you have to do in life is watch one breath. Sometimes people aspire to that simplicity. They work so hard, they build up their finances, they get a nice place, they think, wow, this is it, now I can relax. And they never do, because they don't know simplicity. So instead we just sit here just watching one breath. Sometimes I compare that to people who go to the beach or by a lake and just watch the waves come in, watch the waves go out, watch the waves come in and go out again. It's so tranquilizing. They find some peace. In the old days that's why people used to go to beaches on holidays to relax. Now they've got all these beach sports and, and parties and food and stuff. Beaches are noisy places today. In the old days they used to be very empty and very peaceful and very relaxing. Now when you go to the beach, you come home again, I'm exhausted. But the breath, just coming in and going out, is relaxing. All the time, this is one of the strengths of this simile. You never change what you're doing. You never think, oh, this is where I am, what should I do next? What you've already been doing to take you this far, you carry on doing this, it will take you all the way. What is that? Being aware and being kind. Being kind to the breath. If the breath is rough, it's okay breath, you can be rough. If the breath is shallow, that's all right breath, you can be shallow. If it's unpleasant, it's all right, breath, I love you. You don't have to be like this just for me. You can do whatever you like. They're nice, breath. <laughs> and you do things like that to them, that's called kindness. Can you be kind to yourself? Okay, everybody, get your hand up and give yourself a nice stroke. Come on, there. Nice meditator. Now do it softly with caress, there. Be meditating all day. I still love you there. <laughs> Being kind to yourself is so important. Don't get angry and fed up, you hopeless meditator. Three or four days, all you've done is sleep and eat, and you've ate a lot, and you slept a lot. What's the point, you stupid meditator? Come on. No, don't ever do that. Always be so kind to yourself. And when you're kind to yourself and you can do, keep that kindness going to this, this lovely breath, actually not lovely breath, it's just the full awareness of the breath, the next layer of petals opens up inside the full awareness of the breath, it opens up and oh, gorgeous, the delightful breath. These are very fragrant and beautiful petals. Right inside, you realise that these are right inside this coarse and ugly you know, thing which you're experiencing right now. You think you're so hopeless. I can't meditate, not me, but just right inside of you. This very moment is a delightful breath. Just with kindness and mindfulness it opens up and there you are. With this beautiful, delightful breath, breathing in. Oh yeah, I can take this all day. Yeah, more. Breathing out, out. oh just delightful. You deserve that. Just that much will just give you so much peace and happiness. You're peaceful at last. All the worries of the world, all the trying to get this and get rid of that, all the busyness disappears. You are content. You have peace of mind. Just watching a breath go in, breath go out with not a worry in the world, with nothing missing, no cares or concerns. Isn't that bliss? It is bliss. It just happens, it's a delightful, beautiful lay of petals. The delightful breath. And you're just aware of that. It's so easy to be kind to something which is nice. And then that opens out. And now you get into the very wonderful petals. Right inside the delightful breath, it opens up. And it's beautiful light in the mind. The realm and the world of the nimittas. Right inside the delightful breath. 
It's important that the breath is delightful. If you don't get that delightful breath, then you find there's nothing to watch. There's not enough energy. The mind isn't bright enough. Because what you're seeing inside that delightful breath is the first time you're face to face with your own mind. You're looking at you. That's why it's fascinating when you first see that light, what you see. Because if that light is dull, then you're dull. You haven't got much energy. If that light is beautiful, that means you're beautiful. If that light has got, that uh, vision of light, has got some smear or dark spots on it, that means you haven't been keeping your precepts. <laughs> you can't kid yourself here. This is what it's wonderful. You know, it's a clear looking at your mind. When I said this, this guy in Malaysia, the first time I said this, he came to me afterwards and you know, put himself forward for interview, emergency. He said, I saw my nimitta, I saw my light. It was really grubby and dirty and grey and stained. I said, yeah, what have you been doing? Oh no, I jumped on. <laughs> He'd been really misbehaving. I'm not, he didn't actually tell me what he was doing after some sort of mischief. You can't escape from that. Other people, and I've known them for a long time, they really are pure-hearted people. The sorts of people who would never complain even if you know, that uh, someone else was giving them a hard time. Always there to help when needed. You know, always there to help wash up or care for someone who's sick in the cottage. Always doing extra work, just as really lovely people, pure-hearted people. And I'm sure you know some people like that. Hopefully that's you. Always generous, always kind, never complaining, never getting angry. Those people, when they're they see their mind, it's always incredibly beautiful. Well done. You're starting to see the benefits of your generosity, your compassion and your virtue. You're a good person and you can't fake it. It's right there in front of you. So that's, this is the first time when you see the benefits for meditation in keeping things like precepts in being kind, in being gentle, being forgiving, being generous, giving people the benefit of the doubt. You see it because it's right there, beautiful, beautiful mind, which you've cultivated. That's one of the reasons why we do keep precepts on this retreat. It makes the mind more pure, strong, so when the nimitta comes up, it's easier to watch, it's beautiful. The layer of petals, the nimitta layer of petals. Now what do you do? So many people make the mistake, oh, I've got Nimitta now. All the other instructions go out the window and now they start to control, get excited, get upset, whatever it is. Shut up, please. Just carry on being aware and being kind. Nimitta, if you want to stay, you can. If you want to go, you can go. I'm not going to control you. That's not being compassionate. If you want to move all over the place, the door of my heart is open to you. Whatever you do is fine by me. That's called compassion. It's also called letting things be. Not demanding, not judging. If you judge, you're not kind. As I said, that when I practice compassion in the interviews, whatever you say, I always say, very good. <laughs> so you tell that nimitta, whatever it does, it runs around, it disappears as soon as it comes, very good. Being non-judging is part of compassion. And that means that if you pra still practice just being aware and being kind, you relax so much that the nimitta is still. I did say this last night, the only reason the nimitta keeps moving up and down is because you're moving up and down. It's weird, but for many of you, the first time you see like Nimitta, it's just in the corner somewhere. It's as if it's just coming to see whether you're ready for it. And if you try and look at it, it will just go away. You just remain being aware and being kind. 
And if you're aware and kind enough, that nimitta will come right into the center by itself. Please don't do anything, stop controlling. It's controlling which gets rid of all these things. It's just being still by being mindful and kind is what keeps these things just stable. It's a beautiful layer of petals called the nimitta. And that is absolutely gorgeous. And it gets stronger and more fragrant, stronger and more beautiful. Until eventually you don't do anything. You just have this mindfulness and kindness. And then the layer of petals called the nimitta just opens up. Wow. Now you're really in the deep stuff, in the heart of the lotus. These are the jhanas. And those jhana realms, they will blow you away. You've never been to such places before. You can't even conceive what they're like. That's why one of the Buddha's teachings, Sapurisa Sutta, he told his monks, whatever you imagine it's going to be, even with all the descriptions the Buddha gave, it will be different to that. You cannot guess what these are. All you can say is they're amazing and wonderful. Your body is gone. You don't know where the body is gone. Who cares? You're having the time, not the time of your life, the time of your many lives. It's that beautiful. You can't hear. The bell might go for the chanting. We may even do the chanting. You won't hear a thing. The story of one of the novices when Ajahn Chah was alive. When Ajahn Chah gave a talk, he'd go on forever. Not like, you know, 45 minutes or one hour like I do. When Ajahn Chah started, sometimes he'd go on all night. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hours. And most of it was absolute rubbish. <laughs> it was. Now I can say that because I was his disciple. It was only every now and again he said something profound. And when you read his books, it's all been filtered. They just have the profound stuff, which I had to wait hours for. You get straight away. And sometimes it was so boring, and you'd have to sit there, you couldn't even go to the toilet, and your legs were aching, your back was hurting. But you know, we thought that was part of our practice, you know, being tough guys. But you know, you've probably seen in places like Thailand, sometimes these little boys, because they're orphaned, or because their family have too many children, <laughs> You know, the orphanage for kids was the monastery. So there's always a few young kids, you know, 10, 11 years of age, in the monastery. And there was one kid, you know, a little novice monk, the poor little fellow. You know, he was having to endure this long talk, which he couldn't understand a word of, even though he could understand Thai. And there he was sitting after one hour, he said, look, it's okay for these adults, you know, they're tough. I'm only a kid, I need my sleep. And he started thinking, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When's he going to stop? Another five, when's he going to stop? You know, it's just like that saying, when are, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It became like a mantra for him. He kept on thinking, when is he going to stop? <sighs> when is he going to stop? <sighs> when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? And then there was a moment of insight. Because all you do is insight, you just change it around slightly. And you see things from a totally different angle. And the thought came into his mind, when am I going to stop? And just with that one thought, he stopped. He stopped. When he opened his eyes later, the hall was empty. It was early in the morning. All the monks had finished. They'd done their chanting and bowing and bell ringing. He hadn't heard a word of it. He had the best time of his little life. Well done, little novice. First deep meditation. That would have been a jhana. Which one? I didn't know because I wasn't there at the time. But what he did was stop. Okay, so? Stop. <laughs> One day it'll work. Stop doing things, just be mindful, be kind. 
And this is what happens, amazing experiences. So you don't hear anything, you can't feel anything. Don't worry, if you get into one of these jhanas on the last day, we'll just pick you up, put you in the van, check you in on your aircraft, and when you're flying over Java or somewhere, you come out and say, where am I, where am I, where am I? <laughs> I was just meditating in the hall here, and now I'm in the aircraft. Well done, you just got a nice jhana. <laughs> you're perfectly safe. There was this story, it's in the suttas, of this monk who was in jhana in the forest, and two villagers, they happened to come past in the forest and they saw this monk sitting perfectly still, they couldn't even see him breathing. Oh my God, the monk has died. And you can't leave monks in the forest, and they're dead. You know, they get eaten by animals. And Would you like, you know, your grandmother or grandfather get eaten by animals? You know, would you like your favourite monk, maybe me, to be eaten by animals? So no, we've got to be respectful of our monks. So they were in the forest anyway, they collected some wood, which is all around, made a funeral pyre, put the monk on top, and lit the fire. And once the fire was lit, they didn't need to hang around to see the gory details of the cremation, they just had business to be done. So off they went to do their business, leaving the monk to burn, on top of the funeral pyre, and you can imagine what they felt in the morning when the monk came on arms round. Not even his robe was burnt, let alone his skin. Just walking on arms round in the village. That's what happens if you get into these jhanas. Even if we do take you to the crematorium, put you in the box and put you in the oven, when they open the oven door you'll come out again. <laughs> That'd be really cool, wouldn't it? You'd probably get in the newspapers. Perfectly okay, even your clothes still on, which is you know, really helpful you know, for your modesty. <laughs> that is what happens. So you're perfectly safe. Don't worry about a thing. The difficulty is getting into these states, opening this part of the lotuses. These are such amazing experiences that sometimes you get excited or afraid. That's really common. But when you get into these deep, these are amazing experiences, you're really getting into the juicy stuff of religion. When you get into these things, it's so powerful. Sometimes you feel afraid. No, not me. It's too much for me. I'm only just a lay person. I'm not a monk. I'm not a, sort of a great meditator. I don't want to be a saint. I'm just me, okay? You get fear whether you can handle this. Or sometimes you get excited. Yeah, at last, all these years I've been coming to this retreat and now it's happening, Way Stupid! <laughs> all those years you finally got to the gate and you blow it. Stupid! So, no fear, no excitement. Instead, just continue being kind. Do you notice how kindness overcomes excitement and fear? I'm kind to you. Try to be really kind when some of you come to the interviews, so you're not afraid. Sometimes, I don't know why people are afraid of a monk. We're the, if it was a policeman, if it was just an interrogator for the CIA, if it was the immigration people at Perth Airport, yeah, be afraid. But me, I'm not going to harm you at all. Why are you afraid? So try to be lots and lots of compassion. So there's no fear at all. Kindness overcomes fear. And kindness also overcomes excitement too. So if you really practice a way of kindness and awareness, fear and excitement, they just don't come up. You're so compassionate. You're so soft. You're just like a ball of cotton wool. It falls on the ground, it never breaks never has any dent in it, because it's just cotton, it's soft. So just like a mind which has had so much kindness, it's so soft, excitement just can't make a dent on your mind. Fear just can't break it, it's soft, which means you can go right into these jhanas. And when you go into these first jhanas, while you're in, you're not sure where you are, 
because the mind is too still to contemplate and work things out. To work things out you've got to have a little bit of movement in the mind. So you go into these incredible beautiful states, only when you come out afterwards you think, wow, what was that? That was amazing. And that's where you can actually just analyse when you come out what it was. You find out which particular jhana it was, but my goodness, you've never experienced so much happiness in your life before. You never knew that such bliss could exist. So refined. Many people think that monks and nuns, that we're missing out on life. You've never seen the birth of your child, Ajahn Brahm. You've never had a relationship with a beautiful girl. You've never had great sex. You've missed out so much on life, Ajahn Brahm. And I tell you, you haven't had first jhana, second, third jhana and all those. You've really missed out on life. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm inviting you in to the real juicy part of life, the incredible peaceful jhanas. Now you haven't gone to the end of that lotus yet. There's more to come, there's another few days which I've got to give talks. So I'll be explaining more later on. But just to get to that stage, and this is what happens. You're sitting there just being kind, being mindful. You're not trying to do anything. You're not trying to get somewhere. You're not trying to make it happen. You are just focusing on creating the causes. Just being kind, being mindful. And you find it happens. And it happens when you least expect it. Because all expectations are the big barrier. And you get into some wonderful deep meditations. Later on I will tell you how this will give you all the insights about Buddhism, anatta, non-self, impermanence, teachings of Four Noble Truths and suffering. All this stuff which many Buddhists read about but haven't got a clue what it really means. They can write books about it but they don't understand a fraction of it because they haven't experienced these things. So I want to get you to experience these things first. And then you can understand, ah, oh, that's what the Buddha meant. Ah, oh, yeah, now I understand what he taught, why he taught like that. Now I understand why we have all these no rituals and lots of meditation and lots of kindness, why we have really great food in this place, why you have your own en suites. You understand why we make it this way. So everything gets revealed when you get so still and peaceful. You're right in the middle of the lotus. And it's right there inside of you right now. Just need to unpack it. You unpack it by being aware and being kind. That is all. And it just happens. It's just like the simile of many of you come from overseas. Some of you may have flown from Indonesia on Garuda or Tiger Air, or Singapore Airlines. I'm not quite sure which one you came on. But there's another airline called Buddha Air. And it's already departed a couple of days ago from Jhana Grove Airport. And it flies all the way to Nibbana. Now you're on that aircraft. All you need to do is to sit down and shut up. Because when it's ready, the flight attendant will come. And you don't need to call them, they'll come to your meditation seat. And they'll say, Madam, would you like to have first jhana? <laughs> we have first jhana on the menu as a starter. And you say, mm, yeah, okay. And it's served to you. You don't even need to ask. And after enjoying the first jhana, a few minutes later, the flight attendants come. Do you want the second course? Second jhana? I said, oh yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> you just sit in your seat and everything is served. Soon they come with stream winning. Do you want to be a stream winner? Yeah, I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> and everything gets served. And if you're uh, tray on the aircraft long enough, they come and start serving you with all the psychic powers. 
It reminds me of the story which I read in the in-flight magazine, I think of Air Asia, if you travel Air Asia, of the man who was sitting next to a parrot in the aircraft. Really weird, but the parrot paid his uh, fee, so he got a seat. So there was this guy sitting next to a parrot. <laughs> and a flight attendant came by, and the guy said, can I have a cup of tea, please? He said, yes, certainly, sir. And the parrot said, and give me a scotch, you bitch. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Calling a flight attendant a bitch, that's a bit much. But the flight attendant was so shocked, she went to the galley and came back with a scotch for the parrot. And he, and he forgot the tea. He said, well, what about my tea? I'm oh, sorry, I forgot, you know, I was a bit confused because this parrot, look what it said. <laughs> and in the time that conversation uh, passed, the parrot had downed the whiskey and shouted at the, <laughs> shouted at the flight attendant, and give me another whiskey, you cow. <laughs> and the flight attendant, it's not every day you hear a speech like that. So again, was just so taken aback, went to the galley, and came back with another scotch for the parrot and forgot the tea a second time. <laughs> so this guy thought, there's no way I'm going to get a cup of tea from this flight attendant unless I use the parrot method. <laughs> so he looked to the flight attendant and said, and get me that tea, you pig. And the flight attendant disappeared and a few minutes later came back with two big male attendants who took the both of them out of their seat, opened the emergency door and threw them out of the aircraft at 30,000 feet. And as they were tumbling through the air to the ground, the parrot turned to the man and said, you really have some bad speech for someone who can't fly. <laughs> okay, the parrot can fly, he's safe, the guy's dead. <laughs> So that's a little joke about <laughs> aircraft. So anyway, <coughs> as far as Buddha air is concerned, all you need to do is just sit there and things come to you. It's amazing. So those are the stages which you experience. The longer you are mindful and kind. Just make peace, be kind, be gentle, and it just opens up. When these things do happen, which they do from time to time, that's what you've just been doing. Well done. You interfere and try and make things happen, worry, be concerned, it doesn't happen at all. You are a lotus. Just shine the light of mindfulness, the warmth of compassion, and you will open up and see what's inside. It's incredibly beautiful and profound and change the whole way you look at life. That's what meditation is all about. Okay? That's the talk for this morning. Hope you enjoyed it. Carry on making peace, being kind, being gentle. Sadhu, Sadhu. I thought I'd only be saying it. Very good.